Welcome to Liquid, everybody. Hey, I'm Pastor Tim. Let's give a big welcome to Church Online, all our locations joining us today. Hey, so glad you're here for the kickoff of our brand new series we're calling Through You, which is really all about how God wants to bless your world this summer, your neighborhood, your community, your workplace, your pickleball court, through you. For the next four weeks, our teaching team is going to teach you five simple ways you can actually bless your neighbors right where you live, okay? At home, the beach, work, the gym, a backyard barbecue. Because as a follower of Jesus, the question is this, how, how do you build bridges of authentic faith to folks who are far from God, but they're close to you? How, how do you do that without being weird, <laughs> you know? Because the truth is God wants to share the love of Jesus with ordinary people through you. Now, on your way in today, you should have received a little card. Looks like this. Church Online, I'm going to put it in the chat. Click on that link. I want you to pull this out. Hold it up when you got it, okay, at our campuses. Hey, if you need one, you didn't get one, just raise your hand like this. Our hospitality team will come around right now and get you one. Just keep your hand up. And I've got two questions for you today. You can read them on the back of the card. The first one says this. Who is close to you that is far from God? And the second one says, who's hurting that needs your help. Now, here's the deal. By the end of my conversation today, I'm going to challenge you to write down the names of two people in your world, okay? Could be your neighborhood, could be like that, the lady who lives next door, could be your workout buddy from CrossFit or, or a mom from exercise class or your play group or, or it's a new family who just moved in, you know, or, or across the hall in your apartment building. Do you know somebody who's close to you, but they're far from God that God wants you to bless this summer. Now, listen, don't write anything down just yet. I want you to be thinking about your neighbors as I talk today, because this really is all about the art of good neighboring. Are you a good neighbor? Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. <laughs> Not like that. But think about this, all right? I, I remember a few years ago, walking out on my front porch when I saw this big Mayflower moving truck pull up across the street. And these young, you know, muscular moving dudes got out and they, they rolled up the door and they start pulling out baby furniture. And I watched as a young couple with a little baby girl pull up in a minivan and they pop out and they were our new neighbors. And so I'm watching this and I, I called my son over. He's 17 at the time. I was like, come on, bud, let's go over there and help him. And he's like, oh, come on, I, come on, let's go. We're going to be the welcome wagon. We walked over, we introduced ourselves to the young couple. And we were like, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. We're like, can, can my son and I help you move some of your, your boxes? And, and it was funny because the mom, she wasn't so sure. You know, she kind of like held her baby back. Like, who are, we don't know you, you're stranger danger. But the dad was thrilled. He's like, yeah, please help. And so we helped carry these boxes up the stairs. It was two floors. We dropped them off into the nursery and discovered they were expecting a second child. And uh, when I went back home, my wife laughed and she said, do you remember, Tim, when we were the new kids on the block? 21 years ago, two decades before, a neighbor knocked on our door and said, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. And I remember they invited us over for dinner. And, and, and Colleen, I still remember and appreciate that over 20 years later. The truth is, whether or not you have a new neighbor, the Bible is super clear on how Christ followers are to treat them. As Galatians 5 puts it, says this, I put this in your notes, by the way, in the app. It says this, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall sit together, church. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what's amazing is if you're watching, even people who like not too familiar with the Bible, you've probably heard that rule, right? You thought it came from Instagram or something, okay? It's called the golden rule or the royal rule. But did you know this? The Bible says, love your neighbor. You know how many times it says that? Eight times in eight different places. Not once, not twice, eight times. In fact, in all four gospels, Jesus connects loving your neighbor as yourself with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. But watch this. Here's what James adds. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, 
you are doing right. I like that, the royal law. It's like, this is the king's rules. I want you to think about this. Learning to love your neighbor well is such a priority for God that he repeats it eight times for emphasis. My question is, if sharing God's love and the good news of Jesus with your neighbors is so important, the question I have is this, why does sharing good news sometimes feel so bad? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? As a kid, I grew up in a church that emphasized what they called personal evangelism. That's just the idea of sharing the salvation message with with non-believers, non-Christians. And I remember our pastor said, he said, listen, if hell is real and it is people, then the job of every Christian, you have a responsibility to save your non-believing family and friends. And it was like, okay, no pressure. And the way we were told to do that felt, well, what's the word? Super awkward (laughs) because we were encouraged to do street evangelism where you kind of fan out into your town and you go up to total strangers and you try to engage them with spiritual questions like this. Hey, I know we just met, but if you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going? You know, most strangers like New Jersey are like, bro, you threatening me? (laughs) How many of you ever been in New York City and you encountered someone doing street preaching? Okay, Does 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 this look effective to you? Okay, I mean, gosh, guys, I'm a full-time pastor. I cross the street to avoid guys like this, okay? We were trained, I kid you not, our youth group was trained to put tracks on car windshields. I remember one Saturday, our youth group, we, 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 our, our youth pastor took us to the shop, right? And he handed us a bunch of these little leaflets with Bible verses printed on them. He said, I want you to fan out, stick them under the windshield wipers, all the cars in the shop, right? There's like 200 cars there on a Saturday morning. So we fan out, we start putting the, the tracks on the windshields. And I remember I'm lifting the windshield wiper on this Ford F-150. Just as I'm doing this, a, this bald muscle guy who looked like Joe Rogan comes out with his grocery bag. He's like, yo, punk, what are you doing messing with my truck? And he starts kind of jogging towards us. We literally threw our tracks in the air, jumped in the youth group van and peeled out, okay? And we're in the van and our youth pastor was like, you know, guys, I'm so proud of you. You just shared the good news with 200 people today. <laughs> and even then I was like, did we really? <laughs> like, You know, I shared that story with a friend who grew up in a a church and she said, that's nothing. My church sent us out knocking on doors in random neighborhoods. And we were supposed to pretend we're taking a a survey and the idea was to get their names so we could hand them information on our church and Christianity. Can we we just have an honest moment? How many of you have ever had a Jehovah's Witness come to your door? Okay, now honest moment. Keep your hand up if you ever hid (laughs) and pretended no one's home. Okay. Right? Like I've seen all these strategies for sharing your faith over the years, but the problem is this, lean in. Most of them are divorced from relationship. That's why it feels so awkward or relationally weird. Like you're this used car salesman. You're trying to get somebody to join your MLM, you know, and like sell stuff. It just never made sense to me. Why did sharing the good news always feel so bad? Well, the good news is this. God never meant it to be that weird. That's man, okay? Okay. It's not supposed to be awkward. It's not supposed to be forced. It turns out if you actually follow the biblical example of Jesus, sharing the good news looks a lot like simply being a good neighbor or friend who's genuinely interested. And you're just intentional about blessing the people God's put in your everyday path. The hardest series is that God wants to bless your neighbors through you. Right now, where you are, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, bless you. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say, bless you. Type in the chat. Now, turn to your second choice and say, through you, (laughs) through you. Now, I I don't mean this in that syrupy Southern way of like, oh, bless your heart, okay? Rather, as Dave Ferguson, great author, pastor, he said this, he said, God's way of reaching and restoring the world has always been through a blessing strategy. Bless, B-L-E-S-S. In other words, God's mission to bless the world that did not start actually with Jesus in the New Testament. Did you know that? It began all the way back in Genesis in the Old Testament. I want you to take a listen to this promise that God made to Abram. This is way back in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will, what's the word church? Bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a what? A blessing. I will 
bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be what? Blessed through you. One word repeated five times in three verses. Did you catch it? The word is bless. God says, I will bless you. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you. Everybody on earth is going to be blessed through you. In other words, God's original plan for changing this broken world is through a blessing strategy. That is B-L-E-S-S. I want to share with you a very simple acrostic to help you put this into practice because I think it's so simple. Anybody can do it. We make this complicated, but it's simple. Let me show you. Ready? B stands for begin with prayer. In other words, you simply ask God, which people, God, are you inviting me to bless in my neighborhood this summer or at work? or the coffee shop, or at the pickleball court, or the gym. Who can I bless right where I live, work, eat, and play? Okay? You just start begin with prayer. But then here's the key. L stands for listen. In other words, you don't talk first, but instead you actually take time to listen to people, to their struggles, their pains, in the places God's put you in proximity. You be a friend and you care for them. And then this is my favorite letter. E means eat. You can't just check this off. Okay, it's not quick. You actually have to intentionally sit down and share a meal with people or get drinks or a cup of coffee. Why? Because it builds relationships. You see Jesus doing this all the time with people who didn't know the Father yet. And then S, you serve them. See, if you listen to people and you take time to eat with people, they will tell you how to love them. And you'll know how to serve them in practical ways with no strings attached. And then finally, when the time is right, after you've established trust, then, only then, do you share the story of how Jesus has impacted your life. That's it. That's the outline for this whole series. B-L-E-S-S. Five simple ways to love your neighbors this summer. Now, I want to share this with you up front so you know where we're going for the rest of this month, okay? Because here's the deal. We are going to send you out on a mission, Okay, we're not sending you to the airport to hand out tracts. We're giving you a, a summer assignment. We're not sending you to Walmart and, you know, cost people. Rather, we want to equip you to simply bless your neighbors where you live, where you eat, where you play. Because you're not there on accident. God puts you where you live on purpose for a purpose, and that is to bless people through you. So again, today, I just want to ask a simple question. Who is close to you, that's far from God. Now, what I mean by far from God is I'm not being judgy. It just means they don't personally know the Father's love through Jesus. Like maybe they have some vague awareness of Jesus or like I grew up going to mass, but I I haven't been to church in years. It just means faith isn't a priority for them. They're not walking with the Lord. So my question is who's far from God, but watch this, they're close to you in proximity. You see them at least on like a weekly basis, wherever you live or you, you go out to eat or work or play. Let me tell you who that is for me. For me, it's two 20-something friends. Their names are Bailey and Alyssa. And Bailey and Alyssa work as servers at a local restaurant five minutes from our house, okay? So we see them all the time, at least once a week, okay? We we probably shouldn't eat out that much, but we do. And we actually got to know Bailey and Alyssa pretty good during COVID. It's kind of cool. Bailey is British. He moved here from England to play soccer. And uh, Alyssa is local. She's like the smiliest waitress in New Jersey. We love her. And we just got to know them over the years. And during COVID, we learned that Bailey and Alyssa started dating. And then last summer, Alyssa came to our table and she was all excited. She's kind of glowing. She goes, I've got big news. She goes, I'm pregnant. Now in that moment, by the way, right? We could have acted all religious-y. Well, you know, I'm a pastor and you really should have been married first. Hello, my job is not to judge. My job is to love, amen? It's to bless. And so we said, congratulations. Oh my goodness, and then it was, you know, I was, I, I didn't want to be awkward, but I was like, I was like, is, is Bailey the father? She said, yeah. And he came over. He's like, he's like, yeah, I can't believe it. We're pregnant. And, and so, so I hugged him. I gave him a high five. I was like, congrats, bro. You're going to be a dad. And then I did two things. I said, can I just pray for you guys? That's amazing. God, I pray you're going to bless this new family. And then our table, we doubled our tip that night to bless, just bless the socks off. And they're like, no, we can't. No, we want to bless you, man. Well, that little act of kindness open up a natural conversation because we, we come into our, our regular table and we'd be like, how's the pregnancy coming along? You know, how are you feeling? Morning sickness, anything we can do. 
And I remember Bailey seeing me, and he goes, he goes, uh, I'm, he goes, well, you're you're father of two. He goes, I'm a first time dad, and I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous. I was like, dude, it's not that hard. You just 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 let your wife do it. No, <laughs> I said, let me let me pray for you, Bailey. And I I prayed for him. I said, listen, you're going to be an amazing dad. And I said, listen, since you're going to be a dad, you might as well be a husband too. Have you have you ever thought about getting married? And he said, actually, I have started thinking about that. And I said, well, listen. I, I'm a pastor. When the time is right, let me know. I'd love to marry you guys. He said, really? Yeah. And so we exchanged phone numbers. I was like, text me anytime. Fast forward, their adorable little baby Skylar was born. Absolutely adorable. Mom and dad are doing well. And guess who reached out a month ago? Bailey. He texts me. He's like, hey, Tim, I'm thinking of making it official. Not sure how all of this works, but you mentioned the possibility of marrying us. Can I talk to you about that? And I was like, of course. So Colleen and I invited them over to have dinner this summer with us on our backyard deck. I want you to catch this. They used to serve us dinner. Now it's our chance to serve them dinner. And we love to do that because they're our friends. They are young adults who Jesus loves. And we are very excited to, to share how marriage, it's actually, it's the symbol of God's love for us. Guys, what I just described to you is not a pastoral strategy. That is what authentic spiritual friendship looks like in the real world. It's just natural. It's not forced. It's based on relationship over time. And it always be, begins with prayer. I'm going to challenge you this week to ask this question. Who's close to me, but far from you, God? Now you may say like, Tim, why do you begin with prayer? And the answer is because again, we're taking it right out of the playbook. That's how Jesus began his mission on earth. I want you to think about this. Before Jesus performed one miracle, before he preached a single sermon, he didn't heal a single person yet. The Bible says Jesus began with prayer. Luke 6 says this. One day afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to do what? To pray, and he prayed to God all night. And then at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, and then he chose one, two, three, four, five, twelve 12 of them, to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, Andrew, Jimmy, John, Phil, Bartholomew, Maddie, Thomas, James. Jimmy was there. Simon, who, the zealot, you know him. Judas, not that one, son of James. Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Now, honest moment, okay? If I was Jesus, and I surely am not, but if I had to pick 12 guys that I was like gonna pour my life into, I might've been tempted to skip the prayer part and just pick the guys who seem to be like the most talented. Like, okay, Todd, are you an Enneagram 3 dude? Come on, what's your working genius? Join my team, right? Jesus didn't choose first round draft picks for his team based on their gifting or talent. Instead, it says Jesus spent the night in prayer before handpicking 12 disciples, including common fishermen, <laughs> a corrupt tax collector, a violent revolutionary, and some ordinary everybody, no, nobodies who he just befriended and poured his life into. In other words, these are the 12 who Jesus blessed, and then he sent them out to bless the entire world. That's why you and I are here today. So being on mission with Jesus always begins as Jesus began, and that is with prayer. And so this summer, I want you to pray like Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit, who is close to me that is far from God? Your workout buddy at CrossFit? Maybe it's the mom you always see with her littles at Starbucks. Maybe it's your teammate at work who's going through a divorce. Or your, or your neighbor next door who just moved in. I don't know. Maybe it's the widow across the street who lives alone. God, who are you calling me to bless where I live, work, eat, and play? Do any faces come to mind even right now as I'm speaking? A little moment to breathe. Any faces come to mind? People who Jesus has sovereignly put you in a position to bless. Only after you begin with prayer then the next step is critical. If you don't do this, you blow the whole thing. L means you what? You listen. You don't talk. You simply listen to people. Their struggles, their pains, in the places God's positioned you. Guys, you don't live where you live on accident. Do you know that? The Bible says that God appointed seasons and times and places for men and women to live. God has placed you in their life, in proximity, on purpose. And that is to bring hope and help to people who are hurting. That's the second question on your card. Look at that. It says, who's hurting that needs your help? 
Again, in my world, I would say it's my next door neighbor, Jane. I wrote Jane's name down here because she's a, she's a lovely woman, probably in her 60s. She has lovely grandchildren. They visit her in the summer. We see each other out in the backyard from time to time. But I hadn't seen Jane for a month or more until she came outside. I was like blowing leaves and, um, and she kind of waved. And I was like, hey. And then she kind of went like this. She said, hey, come over, come over here. She waved me over which I thought was unusual. And so I turned off my leaf flower. I'm like, hey, what's going on, Jane? How you doing? She goes, I, um, I have a favor to ask. And I was like, yeah, what's up? And I could tell she didn't look herself. She actually looked kind of shaky, a little, little weak. And she said, I just got out of the hospital and it's been my third surgery in a row. And she went on to tell me about this chronic health issue she's been battling for the last 10 years. I'm not gonna give you the specifics. I wanna respect her privacy. But I, I was like, Jane, I'm, I'm so sorry. You've been, man, you've been through a lot. How, how can I help? And she said, um, I, I don't want to be awkward, but I was wondering, can you pray for me? And like, I was caught off guard. And so she goes, what, listen, she goes, I'm Jewish. And my rabbi visited me in the hospital. But honestly, I feel like I need everybody on my team so I can beat this thing. And someone told me, you're a pastor. Do you, and maybe you pray for people. And I was like, absolutely. And, and we talked some more. I listened to her story. And right there in our backyard, as I'm holding a leaf blower, I said, Lord, this is that moment. And so I, I said, can I put my hand on your shoulder? And she goes, of course. She just kind of bowed her head. And there in the backyard, I like went for it. I put my hand on Jane and I prayed, like I prayed for some of you. I said, Jesus, you created this amazing woman in your image. She is a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and you love her. And so Jesus... We ask, would you touch her body and flood her with your healing power? Lord, from the top of your head to the tips of her toes, flood her with your power and presence, just as a sign of your great love for her. Father, I pray the prayer of Hezekiah. Lord, lengthen her life. Give her 15 more years for her grandchildren. Touch her body, just show her your love and just, just touch her. I pray for a durable remission, complete restoration in Jesus' name, amen. And I opened my eyes and Jane is just staring at me. And she goes, wow, you're good. <laughs> I go, what, what do you mean? What do you, what do you? She, goes, she goes, I'm sorry. She goes, my rabbis come to pray for me all the time. He doesn't pray like that. Honestly, he mainly gives me platitudes. And we, and we talked some more about my own father's battle with long-term illness. And now we have this back and forth friendship. I, I routinely check in with her. I'm like, Jane, how's it going? And she knows I'm on her team. And I'm like, Jane, of course I'm on your team. Jesus was Jewish. Count me in your corner, right? <laughs> What's my point? If you will take the time to listen to your neighbors, they will tell you how to love them. Listening to people is one of the most loving things you could do. Did you know this? 79% of non-religious people are open to talk about spiritual things, but it has to be with a trusted friend. Barna did a recent study and they asked friends and neighbors what they value most and somebody they would talk to about spiritual matters. And the top two qualities were this, their ability to listen without judgment. Listening's like one of the purest acts of love. What your neighbors want most is someone just to, to sit down, to lean in and listen and actually absorb their, their stories, their pains, their questions, not so you render judgment, but so they can process their feelings and experience in relationship. The sad news is that about two thirds of people surveyed said they had no one in their life who would listen without judgment. Think about that. Guys, it's a great opportunity, but let's be honest. Christians are often known most for talking more than listening. Guys, God gave you two ears, one mouth. What do you think he's saying? He wants you to listen twice as much as we speak because that's how you love people. And they want room to draw their own conclusions. So understand something, this is so important because I know some of you right now, you're starting to write down names. I see some of you scribbling. You're like, I'm gonna talk to Ron. Listen, your neighbors are people, not projects. This is vital. Nobody wants to be somebody's pet project, okay? What they're looking for is a genuine friend who isn't gonna try to convert them, but actually trust that God's already at work in their life. And only after you've listened to your friend or your neighbor and you build trust over time, only then are people interested in hearing your own story of faith. And hopefully you have one to tell, right? Of how the love of God and faith in Jesus has made a difference in your life. So again, I'm just gonna ask this question. Who's hurting in your world that needs your help? Is it a teammate at work who's going through divorce or illness? 
Maybe it's a single parent who's just struggling to make ends meet. Don't be afraid to turn off your leaf blower. Put down your pickleball paddle and go over and ask them, how's it going? Because when you genuinely care, people will tell you how to bless them. You begin with prayer, you listen, and then my favorite part, you e, you eat. You got to do this, okay? How many of you have this spiritual gift of eating, okay? You just like, <laughs> why did Jesus always eat with people? Because to really build relationship, you got to share a meal or grab drinks or have a cup of coffee because it deepens friendship. Again, we look back to the master. Jesus did this all the time. In fact, Jesus was not just a friend. You know what the Bible calls him? A friend of other Christians. No, <laughs> a friend of what? Friend of sinners. And guess what? He was criticized for it. In Matthew's biography, he writes this. He says, while Jesus was having dinner at my house, that's Matthew, <laughs> many tax collectors and sinners came and did what? They ate with him and his disciples. So they had lunch, they had dinner. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, hey, uh, question, why does your teacher eat with these unclean people, tax collectors, sinners? They don't go to temple. <laughs> because everywhere Jesus went in his community, he befriended people. He shared lunch in their homes, dinner on the dock. He broke bread with them so he could bless them. So part of your summer assignment, guys, is to eat. Now, this is going to be easy for some of you. But I want you to imagine having a backyard barbecue and inviting your neighbors over for pulled pork tacos. That's evangelism. Praise God. Who loves it, okay? Food is just this, 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 this gateway. It's this powerful way to break down barriers. So I want you to listen to your pastor, okay? Just because you're pastor. I want you to invite people over for a burger or beer this summer. Okay, you just, you heard that right from me. You've got homework. If you want to deepen spiritual friendship with your neighbors, invite them over for, you know, margaritas on the, on the dock, you know, whatever. Sausages on the grill. Mexican tacos with street corn. Eating is evangelistic, praise the Lord, okay? So again, in a couple weeks, Colleen and I are having Bailey and Alyssa over for dinner on our deck. And they're like super excited um, because they think they're coming just to talk about a wedding. But we're like, we said to them, listen, wedding's the easy part. We'll give you all sorts of how a wedding works. But we want to talk about your marriage. And we're actually going to share it. If you guys want, we'll meet with you a few times and go through Symbus together. We have this curriculum, Symbus, Save Your Marriage Before It Starts. It's this premarital um, program that pairs a couple who's been married a long time, 25 years for us, with a young couple, couple about to get married. And so Carl's like, I'm going to make my, you know, her famous flank steak and we'll grill and we'll reverse rolls with our friends. Bailey and Alyssa have served us dozens of meals at the restaurant. And now we get to serve them in our home. And we feel like super blessed for them to come because hospitality will deepen our friendship as we, S, serve them in Jesus' name. Jesus told his disciples straight up. He said, listen, guys, I know what you're gonna do. You're gonna make this about power. The son of man didn't come to be served, but what? To serve. The truth is, if you listen to people, and you eat with people, they will tell you how to serve them. And this works in any context. This works if you live in a, a city apartment or you have a town home or you're out in the suburbs in a cul-de-sac or you're in a farmhouse out in the country. It doesn't, doesn't matter where you live. You just ask simple questions like, who's moved into my neighborhood recently? Like, can you think about that? You have someone who just moved in? Who in your neighborhood just had a baby? <laughs> okay, okay. Could you this summer take over a meal? Could be homemade, could be takeout, I don't care. Just to offer support and extend friendship. How about at work? Are there ways you could support your coworkers outside of working hours? You know what I'm talking about? Like nobody really cares. Sorry, boss, it's at the office. But do you have a coworker who like plays in a band? Could you actually show up at their concert? Or maybe you've got a hobby they could support them in? Uh, for instance, my, uh, my next door neighbor, Jane, I discovered, turns out as we've gotten to know her, she's a writer. And during her chronic illness over the last decade, she wrote a novel of historical fiction. And I saw her the other day in the driveway and she's like, my, I said, how's your book coming? And she goes, it's actually coming out this month. And so she invited Colleen to me to a, she's doing like a book reception and signing and everything on Friday night. We're literally going Friday night. And we're like, of course we're gonna show up to that. Why? Because Jesus loves Jane and so do we, amen? Again, if you take the time to listen to people, enter their world, they will tell you how to love them. And the truth is this, guys, listen, most people are not looking for solutions. They're looking for support. Again, keep it simple. 
God, how, how can I bless Aaron in a practical way? How, maybe I could help my neighbor Paul build his fire pit or, or, or mow his grass. Or maybe I could babysit Denise's dog while, while they go on vacation. Pray, listen, look around and you will see chances to serve all around you. Is anyone at work going through something hard? Maybe a sick child or an upcoming move? You could jump in and just be like, I'll, I'll, I'll help you with that. When you're out and about in town, is there somebody in your town that you just have like favor with? You know what I'm talking about? Like they just took a shine to you. Like maybe it's the manager at your gym where you work out, you know? Or it's the barista at the cafe who always gives you just a little extra whipped cream. You know what I'm saying? Blessing. (laughs) Or it's the wait staff at your favorite restaurant who they just like talking with you. How can you bless and serve them this summer? Has Jesus put you in proximity to anyone elderly or disabled in your neighborhood? What do they need help with? Yard work, house chores, caring for a pet. Lean in and listen and then share your life. Serve them gladly, no strings attached. And don't be surprised when eventually they ask to hear your story. The final S in God's blessing strategy. When the time is right, now we talk and you get to share the story of how Jesus impacted your life. See, when you genuinely befriend and bless people, no strings attached, they feel safe relationally. And naturally, they ask about your story. And then and only then do you actually get to share how the love of God has impacted you. And we're going to teach you how to do that, by the way, in a very simple, organic way, nothing forced, nothing manipulative in the final week of the series. I can't wait for you to hear this. Guys, right now, this summer, people are looking for spiritual friends. And as our culture convulses and it's all political and and too many Christians are talking instead of listening, Too many Christians are known for what they're against rather than what we're for. God created you to love and bless your neighbors. It was his original game plan from Genesis. I will, read this together, church. Come on, loud voice. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and all people on earth will be blessed through you. B-L-E-S-S. Jesus blessed people right where he lived. And wherever he went, he's calling you to do the same thing. So this summer, guys, we're going on an adventure with Jesus. I want you to get ready for this. I'm serious. I'm I'm serious. If you will do this, expect the Holy Spirit to direct you. We're going to talk about that next week. How, How can you sense when it's the Holy Spirit speaking, when it's God nudging you? How do you know it's not just your own voice? God will put you in proximity to non-believers. If you'll trust the Holy Spirit to give you opportunities, you'll be shocked at how you get to share and show the love of Jesus to ordinary people. Guys, as your pastor, I'm excited about this. Just, just I know there's going to be stories that come from this, but it really begins with, well, two simple questions that only you can answer right now. You ready? Click a pen, type it in the chat. Who's close to you that's far from God? You've become aware of them over the last few minutes. Who's hurting in your world that maybe needs your help? I want you to think of the people in your orbit, the faces God's calling to mind. I want you to write the names of two people in your world. I've got Bailey and Alyssa. I've got Jane. Could be at school, from the gym, the exercise class, laid next door, the family at the end of the cul-de-sac. I don't know. Listen, write their name down because you're not there by accident. God put you in their life on purpose for a purpose, his purpose to bless them. So write their name right now or when you get home. And here's the deal. Tomorrow morning, I want you to, I want to commission you. I want you to begin praying for them, listening, sharing a meal, serving them and sharing the love of Christ with them. Let's get out of the church, guys. I mean this. Let's get out of our church's four walls this summer and into people's backyards and restaurants where they live, work, eat, and play. Who knows? Listen, listen, listen. A year from now, you may have your own story of someone meeting Jesus because they encountered him through you as you prayed and you listened and you ate and you served them this summer. It all starts right here. Liquid Church, let's do this something right now. I just want everybody to stand up right now where you are. All our campuses, would you just stand together for prayer? Church in line, stand up where you are, man. Come on. As your pastor, I just want to commission you. In fact, once you're standing, I want you to hold up your card, hold up your card. And I actually want you to hold it over your heart. Put it over your heart. Because those people are close to the Father's heart. And Jesus wants to bless them through you. Lord, I pray right now for these precious people, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, for the names you've put on our hearts. 
Lord, I just know even as I've been speaking, you're calling to mind faces, names of people who are far from you, but they're close to us. And so, Father, with a hand on our heart, we say yes. Just say yes. Send me, Lord. Let us be your ambassadors this summer. I ask for your Holy Spirit's power and wisdom and the joy of the Spirit to anoint every man, woman, and child as we leave this place and go out into the mission field, into the streets and the sidewalks and the backyard barbecues and the pool where we live, work, play, and pray. I pray you would open divine opportunities and appointments to show spiritual friendship in office buildings, down the shore at the beach. I pray for the Spirit of Jesus to be present at every backyard barbecue. Let us be, Jesus, your winsome witnesses this summer. We say yes to the invitation, Father. Now fill us with your love and send us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, all God's people said together, amen. Thanks for watching Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you were blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.